Oh, hey. So this week, I want to slow things down a little bit and just chat about film critics and film criticism, what the point of it is, and what we want from it. Because for a while now, I've been noticing some things that kind of trouble me. And I'm not coming here to tell you that you're wrong, unless you are actually wrong about indisputable facts, but just to offer my take on things. So, film criticism. It's been around pretty much since the beginning of cinema itself, and it's an extension of art criticism, which has been around since like the 1700s. Now, right up front, I wanna clear up some misconceptions that I know some people have. Critics are not bought or bribed. Disney does not pay off critics to trash DC movies. It's not like bad reviews hurt Suicide Squad's box office, so why would studios waste money on that? I mean, sure, they would like good reviews because it helps with marketing, but no critics are actually being paid off by studios. That's nonsense. Critics are not an amorphous entity that all conspire together with one single opinion. So when someone complains about the critics, they really mean hundreds of individual people all with their own unique opinions. And critics do not hate everything. They have to watch every movie that comes out, so you genuinely have to love movies if you want to do that job. Critics are not Lindsay Duncan from Birdman, cruelly determined to take down something they haven't even seen. Okay, so we're clear on that. Critics are not evil, are corrupt, are a huge single-minded being? Great, let's move on. Quick disclaimer, in this video, I'm referring to critics specifically as the people who regularly review new movies. So while I make some videos that are technically film criticism, I don't count as a film critic. I've never done a review before. I did a survey on Twitter the other day where I asked people who their favorite critics are, and I was kind of shocked at the answers. Probably more than half the critics mentioned are YouTube film critics, and a lot of people said that they don't follow any critics who write traditional, like, written reviews. And this really concerned me. But let's step back for a minute and talk about what the purpose of film criticism is anyway. The first part of that answer is easy. It's to guide us in our decisions about what movies to see. A review should give us an idea of what a movie is and whether the critic thinks it's worth seeing. That's obvious. But there's a second component to criticism. In Douglas Martin's obituary for Roger Ebert in the New York Times, he wrote, not only did he advise moviegoers about what to see, but also how to think about what they saw. It's that second part that I think gets overlooked too often. A critic should have a deep knowledge and understanding of cinema, its history, and how it works. And they should bring that perspective to the review, not just telling us if the movie is good or bad, but deepening our understanding of it, and giving us things to think about that we otherwise might not have noticed or considered. This, for me, is the problem with most YouTube film critics. They're predominantly straight white males in their mid-twenties to early thirties, and I find their reviews to be pretty shallow. They'll tell you that the acting was great, or the jokes didn't all land, or I was on the edge of my seat the whole time, but they hardly ever dig any deeper. But clearly, a lot of people are cool with that, and I'm not saying you're wrong for enjoying them. The traditional view of film critics is older people like Roger Ebert, Pauline Kael, A.O. Scott, who are film experts, who are like authorities on the matter. But now, because the internet has democratized opinions and film culture, a lot of people, especially younger people, want critics who are kind of like friends. Someone of a similar age and demographic with similar interests and tastes who will tell them, yeah, it's awesome, or no, it sucks. Now, I don't think a critic needs to work for a major publication for their opinion to matter. But the qualifications for most YouTube critics seems to just be having seen The Dark Knight at least five times in theaters. And to be fair, I did too. And look, before you comment about it, I'm not counting Bob Chipman among the other YouTube film critics because he basically just writes traditional written reviews and then turns them into videos. And look, of course I use reviews to determine what movies I'm going to see. I have my own list of critics I respect whose opinions I partly base my film viewing on. But that's not where the role of film criticism ends. I'm gonna go back to Roger Ebert, the most famous and quite possibly the best film critic we've ever had, and pull up a quote from him. He says, why do we need critics? I don't believe readers buy a newspaper to read variations in the line, you are correct, sir. A newspaper film critic should encourage critical thinking, introduce new developments, consider the local scene, look beyond the weekend fanboy specials, be a weatherman on social trends, bring in a larger context, teach, inform, amuse, inspire, be heartened, be outraged. And this to me is the difference between most YouTube film critics and the best traditional critics. The ones on YouTube tend to offer the viewer's own perspective back to them, but the really good ones offer more. I want to read critics who really know their shit, 
whose opinions, whether I agree with them or not, are educated and come from a real understanding of how film works. Don't tell me this film is gorgeously shot, tell me why it's shot that way and what purpose it serves. So here's a quote from film critic Matt Zoller Seitz talking about film criticism. He says, Movies and television are visual art forms and oral art forms. They are not just about plot, characterization, and theme. Analytical writing about movies and TV should incorporate some discussion of the means by which the plot is advanced, the characters developed, the themes explored. It should devote some space, some small bit of the word count, to the compositions, the cutting, the music, the decor, the lighting, the overall rhythm and mood of the piece. Otherwise, it's all just book reports or political op-eds that happen to be about film and TV. It's literary criticism about visual media. It's only achieving half of its potential, if that and it's doing nothing to help the viewer understand how a work evokes particular feelings in them as they watch it. It is not necessary for a critic of film or television to have created a work of film or television, but it's never a bad idea to know a little bitty, eensy-teensy bit about how film and television are made. I mean nuts and bolts. Where the camera goes and why it goes there. Why a scene included a lot of over-the-shoulder shots of a character speaking, even though the angle prevents you from seeing their lips moving. Why a particular scene was played entirely in close-up or entirely in long shot. Basic stuff. And building on that, with film criticism, I think it's essential to read perspectives different from your own. If you're a 20-something white dude and you only watch reviews by 20-something white dude critics, you're not gonna learn much. Read reviews by women and people of color. Read reviews by critics who know way more than you do about movies and read reviews by people you disagree with. So Richard Brody is the chief film critic for The New Yorker. He's incredibly smart, he's a great writer, and he knows more about film than I probably ever will. I also barely ever agree with him on anything. A couple years ago, he wrote an article about how just about all the Star Wars movies are bad, except for the prequels, which he considers to be triumphs of cinema. To pretty much everyone watching this video, this is insane. I think it's insane but it's also absolutely worth reading, because it comes from someone who really knows what they're talking about, and it challenges the opinions that we've held for pretty much our whole lives. Okay, let's talk about Rotten Tomatoes. We have to. Now, I wanna clear up one thing that might seem obvious to most people, but I promise you, there are people who aren't aware of this. Rotten Tomatoes is not a group of people who give movies grades. It does not review movies. It has no opinions of its own. Rotten Tomatoes is an algorithm. It is a review aggregator. It adds up every review published for a given movie and then tells you what percentage of those reviews are positive. And the score does not necessarily reflect quality. It's really a reflection of how broad a movie's appeal is. So Thor Ragnarok has a 92%. So does The Shape of Water. Does that mean that critics thought those movies were equally good? Probably not. It just means that the same number of critics enjoyed them both. Here's my usual routine for digesting film criticism. Before seeing a movie, I'll skim reactions from critics I trust on Twitter, or glance briefly at the reviews, and if enough of them seem to dig it, I'll see the movie. Then afterwards, I'll go to Rotten Tomatoes and pull up all the reviews from critics I like and read all their takes on it, because I want to see a bunch of different perspectives. For example, with a movie like Black Panther, a review by a 25-year-old white guy on YouTube is probably not going to have much to offer, but that's also the only critical perspective a lot of people are seeking out. There's infinitely more to be gained by reviews from people of color, who can offer an educated discussion about the cultural and historical aspects of the movie, who can dig into the politics and what the movie is actually saying. After I saw that movie, I had zero interest in looking at reviews that just repeated my own thoughts back at me. I wanted to learn more and deepen my understanding of the film, and I wasn't going to get that from critics whose perspectives were identical to my own. But I think that's reflective of a lot of film culture on YouTube. A lot of people just want to hear someone articulate exactly what they already think, and that can be satisfying. I enjoy it sometimes too. But film criticism is about more than that. It's about having our perceptions of art challenged and expanded. It's a discussion, not an echo chamber. So if you don't already, I highly recommend following critics who write traditional movie reviews. Critics who know more than you about film, who come from different backgrounds and offer different perspectives. And obviously not every critic is good. Plenty are bad. Like Rex Reed? That guy sucks. So if you're staring at the hundreds of critics on Rotten Tomatoes with no clue how to tell who's worth reading, let me offer some suggestions. These are some of my favorite critics working right now, and whether you agree with them or not, I think they're worth reading. So Matt Zoller cites Matt Singer, Amy Nicholson, Jen Yamato, David Sims, Drew McWeeny, David Ehrlich, 
Wesley Morris, Sid Adlaka, Scott Tobias, the folks on the Slash Film cast, Manola Dargis, Bill Gabiri, Jordan Hoffman, Allison Wilmore, Glenn Kenny, Tasha Robinson, Mike Ryan, Priscilla Page, Britt Hayes, Emily Yoshida, Richard Lawson, Angie Han, and Go back and read old Roger Ebert reviews, because they're really good. There's plenty more that I like, and I apologize to the ones I'm forgetting right now. I'm sure I'll be kicking myself about it as soon as I stop recording. But what I'm trying to say is that if you like movies, you should read film criticism. Good film criticism. Honestly, it will make you like movies even more. So, that's all. Oh, and one last thing. Uh, CinemaSins is terrible. It's absolute garbage and it actively hurts film criticism. So my recommendation is to not watch it. That's all. Bye. Okay, so if you like the videos we're making and you want to help us make more of them, you should check out the Patreon. If you want to yell at me about stuff and get updates on the things that we're working on, follow me on all the social media links. Shout out to Andrew Dunsang, and I will see you next Wednesday. <laughs>